Namaste. Well, I'm happy to see the song, A Love Supreme, finally released and out there for you to listen to. This song took me 12 years to write. Well, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> In fact, 12 years is exactly one cycle, complete orbital cycle of Jupiter. And I looked it up on the astrology last night. And when I started writing this song about September 1st, 2011, Jupiter was exactly 12 degrees Aries and retrograde. And where is Jupiter today? <laughs> you guessed it, 12 degrees Aries retrograde. So exactly one Jupiter cycle later. Now I have Jupiter in the ninth house of religion. So to me, these creative projects are part of my religion, part of my worship of God, part of my program for self-realization. So, uh, you know, even though they're fun and they're a blast to do, I take them very seriously from the philosophical point of view. So the history of my uh, appreciation of Coltrane's Love Supreme began a long time ago when I was a boy. I used to live about a mile from Rudy Van Gelder's legendary recording studio in Hackensack, New Jersey. And I used to bike down there as a young aspiring jazz musician. I would ride down there on my bike and hang out across the street and watch the musicians, you know, these famous musicians come and go. And sometimes my friend Murray would come from Patterson on the bus and we would go there together. He was also a jazz musician. So, in fact, Murray is still around. Last time I checked, he's still in Manhattan playing the same songs that we used to play together when we were young together uh, in uh, some restaurant uptown or something like that. If you know Murray, hey, give him a shot at, and have him get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from him. But anyway, Murray and I, we'd hang out and we got to meet like everybody who was anybody in the mid-60s jazz scene. I met Coltrane a couple of times. I met Miles Davis and, and their bands, all the sidemen, their musicians. Um, that's not how I met Eric Dolphy. Eric Dolphy was my horn teacher. Uh, I met him at an Orchestra USA concert, but he used to hang out there too. He was one of Coltrane's side men. I don't know if he played with Miles Davis. I don't think so. A different, different style of cat completely. But anyway, uh, he became my teacher and he introduced me to lots more musicians. And I used to go into New York all the time uh, for gigs in the village and like that. So I hung out with these dudes, except then they weren't dudes, they were cats. <laughs> this was still during the beatnik era when it was cool to wear a beret, you know, <laughs> and snap your fingers, hey man, you know. So I hung out with all these cats back in the day. <laughs> and uh, the thing about them that was so influential about not just music, but philosophy, is that they were all studying the Buddha Sutras and the Vedas, especially Vedanta and the Upanishads. Uh, I didn't really get it at the time. You know, I was born and raised in a, uh, an Episcopalian family, and while I was uh, uh, an autodidact, and I had educated myself on many things, you know. Um, the Eastern philosophy was still like on another level. <laughs> I didn't get how deep they were. But now looking back on it, now that I understand everything and I've read and studied deeply all these same books, I realized, wow, these guys were like 
decades ahead of anybody in the West. And their music was too. These were the trendsetters. These were the guys exploring new forms of jazz, you know, especially Coltrane. And Coltrane had a very deep religious sentiment. He was definitely a lover of God. I get really ecstatic when I think about this, how passionate he was and how his music reflects this uh, beautiful love of God that he manifested in his life and art. So A Love Supreme, this was 1963. This was about the time when I used to hang out there at the studio. He came in and did the whole thing in like one take, took him about four hours, him and his band, which is amazing. Means this was something coming from deep within all of them that they were expressing themselves in a very spontaneous way, even though the piece itself is quite structured. Uh, evidently, Coltrane had mapped out the sections and stuff like this and even written a poem, which is the only time he did anything like this, which he plays. So he, he recites the poem, not in words, but in music in one of the movements of A Love Supreme, which, by the way, you should definitely go listen to. It is one of the groundbreaking pieces, and especially the first movement and the third movement, A Love Supreme and what's called Pursuit. Because when he says pursuit, what he's talking about means sadhana, pursuing God, finding God, getting to know God, making a relationship with God, loving God, serving God. This was his life, his inner life anyway. On the outside, you know, he played it cool like one of the regular guys, you know, but he was never a regular guy. He was always in this exalted spiritual consciousness. And it comes out in his music. Now, Coltrane's music I'm going to put a diagram up here on the screen. This is a chart that he did for another guy that I know, Youssef Latif. Met him out on the West Coast later on. Youssef Latif is now a university professor and a scholar of jazz uh, at some university. And Coltrane made this diagram to explain the harmonic progressions in his music. And yeah, it's really complicated. So is his music. And the interesting thing about Coltrane's music is that it's both polyrhythmic and polytonal. In other words, he's playing in several different time signatures, or the whole group is, playing in several different time signatures at once and several different keys at once. And here's the way it works out. Now, in jazz, you have the bass, the drums, the piano, and the horn to lead. And it's possible for each one of them to be, first of all, at a different rhythmic division of the time. For example, the bass player is often playing quarter notes, eighth notes, or even half or whole notes. He's the slowest one. He's at the bottom, anchoring the root of the chords. Then you have the drummer. Now the drummer is also playing with the bass player, but at the same time he can play a polyrhythm or a counter rhythm, like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like that, three against four. And then of course the piano player is even much freer because he doesn't have to hold down the rhythm like their bass and drums. They are the rhythm section. The piano is kind of in the middle between rhythm and harmony. And they can be much freer, and especially when you hear a solo, they can play almost like a horn player, really free. And finally, so they're usually on the eighth note and quarter note, and sometimes sixteenth note level. But the horn, Coltrane's horn, is almost always at the sixteenth note level. 
You listen to him play, he's all over that thing. He's amazing, what virtuosity, you know? If you ever tried to play a tenor saxophone, I mean, first of all, it's heavy, you know? You have to like lift it up and put a strap around your neck because you can't hold it up with, just with your hands. It's too heavy. And it takes a lot of wind and wind pressure to blow. Now, I was a flute player mainly, and I also played alto and soprano. But I mean, I tried tenor sax. The most I could do is play rock and roll on it. I could never really play jazz on it because it's just too hard to play. But Coltrane, man, he was all over that thing. So what was happening rhythmically was well, there, there were these divisions. And at the same time, tonally, harmonically, the bass player was holding down the root. The piano player, however, was playing mainly diminished chords. Now, I don't know how much you know about harmony, but a diminished chord can substitute for a dominant seventh chord, which is the main chord in jazz. The dominant seventh chord is the blues chord. And of course, jazz is totally based on blues. So the blues chord opens up into this range of tonalities because the uh, diminished chord that substitute for it can have four different tonal interpretations, at least. In other words, it can be considered to be in more than one key at the same time. And this is how Coltrane and his guys played. They played in simultaneously several different keys at once. And Coltrane himself could shift instantly from one to another. It's just amazing, the stuff that he played. Not only technically, as far as playing the horn is concerned, but conceptually, how he could think and pre-hear what he was going to play. In other words, imagine what he's going to play before he actually played it in several keys at the same time. It's just mind boggling. So when you listen to Coltrane, there's a feeling of being overwhelmed. And this overwhelming feeling is due to this polyrhythmic, polytonal jazz. What happens from an information point of view is that the uh, circuits in your brain that decode what you hear into feelings of key and rhythm get overloaded with information. It's too much information. He went beyond all the limits that had previously existed for the amount of tonal information in a jazz song or, or any kind of music. And since Coltrane, I think what happened is that other musicians heard Coltrane, they respected what he was doing, even though maybe they couldn't do it. Uh, some of them tried to imitate what he was doing. And of course, it was technically usually beyond them. And what they wound up playing was just nonsense. <laughs> So-called free jazz. Uh, it's not the same thing. But anyway, most of the jazz world heard Coltrane as a challenge, and they backed down. They backed off. They said, uh-uh, we're not going there. We can't go there. And we don't know who among our audience can go there. <laughs> Nobody's going to be able to listen to this stuff. It's just beyond. And that's the feeling I tried to explain in this song. The words are self-explanatory, uh, especially the first line. I want a love that lasts forever. And of course, that immediately cuts out all kinds of mundane love uh, to an earthly personality or something like that. Only love of God is eternal. Eternal love, a love supreme. This is the ultimate. And this is what Coltrane's expressing in his song. And this is what I tried to bring out or explain a little bit <laughs> in my song that follows it. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs> 